Thank you for inviting us. Uh, as Michael said, my name is Mark Keating. I'm Managing Director of Shadow Gat Systems Limited. It's a consultancy based in the northwest of England, out of Lancaster. Uh, we deal with quite a large number of clients worldwide, and we deal with uh, quite a large number of community projects. The talk's called Embrace Your Community, an open model for business, and I'm hoping to give you a feel for why we as a company use free software, and why we like to involve ourselves in the open source and free software communities. Specifically, this is going to relate to, to PER, but I think it relates to any programming language that you'll encounter. So, uh, I'm going to thank Stephen Little, who did a talk, um, which is, that's the source for it. Um, he did a talk called Code for Free. Um, Stephen works up for a company called Infinity Interactive, and this, his talk was a good basis for where I wanted to go. Very formative in my thinking. So, look at free software. The definition of free software is free libre open source software is a liberally licensed grant users the right to use, copy, study, change, and improve its design for the availability of its source code. Now, during this talk, I'm going to focus more on just one single word, and that word is improve. Because I think using free software is something that actually improves you and yourself, and improves your business, and involving yourself in the community improves you. So a little bit about Shadowcat Systems. Um, Shadowcat Systems was formed in 2005. Uh, Matt and I had worked on several projects together just before we formed the company, and I think then basically you, get, you gave me the idea of joining you with a sort of, I want to be a bit in a business, you're going to be the business manager. Because <laughs> I can't be bothered doing that shit. I think <laughs> those are somewhere around the words, possibly with more swearing. And right from the very start, it was decided we'd pursue an open source model for the business and use free software. And that we'd try to gain clients who actually also believed in the same model that we did. Um, part of our con standard contract actually states that we use a lot of open source modules, we, we use free software, we use things licensed under, under the GPL, and that as a, a client you agree to allow us to reuse anything that we create back into the community. Now there is a, a small problem with that because of course an open model does mean an open choice, which means that the client can say, well, no, I don't want to do that. This particular module is my business model as well. Um, in that case, we would either limit the amount of free software we use for that thing. I'll try to create the complete bespoke answer for that particular part, if we possibly can. The idea being is that we believe that you should put, always put back to the community and would reflect to them that it's going to be more expensive if they don't use an open model. Because we, there's no way that they could use anything that breaches the GPL or will act in a manner that would do that because we're not willing to. It's not really been a problem for us. Most of our clients are actually quite happy to do what, what we do, which is contribute back into the communities. Now, we don't actually insist that clients themselves engage in the community aspect. Most companies don't. They don't engage in any community except for using free software. We try to encourage it. We like to pursue a sort of active, positive thing about community and promote it to all the companies we work with. And we try to get them to involve themselves, even if it's just funding something, back into the community. Uh, as a consultancy, you take what I like to think of as a hit from the start. Um, aside from all the things of being a consultancy, you take a hit if you're using free software. And that hit is that a lot of businesses that are hire consultants are medium to large enterprises. And they tend to favour closed software. They tend to favour things that are, are supported by what they think is larger companies. Um, there's an idea and a notion of enterprise quality and business stability in some software systems. And they tend to go for companies that use that. So even if you get a now open language such as say Java, the companies behind it don't pursue an open model. They pursue a, a pretty much a very closed model. And they dominate the entire the consultancy and they, and they dominate the thinking around it. So you take a hit if you're going to use an open language. This though has shifted. I mean, you, we could say that we anticipated the shift. Uh, Matt could possibly say it. I would, I would be a liar if I did. Um, a lot of the largest companies you'll find now hanging around a lot are using open software, and you've seen them all. Um, Apple based offsets on BSD. We've got Twitter using Ruby and Scala. Facebook has its own flavor of PHP. Google favor Python. And Facebook, sorry, Amazon will favor a bit of Perl, though they do have sort of derivative companies now. Love Firm is one of them. That's Amazon owned. That's entirely Perl based. Now, I was dragged into the way of thinking that open source software was good. 
Um, and Matt, I think, had to patiently drag me into thinking that open source software was good and that an open method was better than a closed method. Because my idea of software at the time was that you gave, to give away the majority of what you create was absolute madness. Why give away something you created just freely to everybody else so that they can use it? Surely you should create something, you should take it away with you, you should patent it, make it unique, guard it closely and bite them if they come anywhere near trying to take it off you. And this is insanity. If this thinking led to companies such as Google buying Motorola, not because Motorola is a great company or because they want to protect the hardware, they just want the patents that Motorola are now on. They want, to, they want the idea of owning an idea, and that's where we've come now. You can now patent an idea. Before you even create anything, you can patent the idea that you had that idea, and then stop, try to stop people from having that idea, even if they create it in isolation of you. You can say, no, that was my idea first, I patented this ten years ago when I was just idly writing things down on the back of a, of a piece of paper. Um, we can't have that. So what we have instead is Libra. Um, the state of being free, with little or no restriction. Now Matt, I think, was far more engaged with the communities around this. Um, it wasn't really uh, just about being given free software, though. Uh, that's a misnomer in terms of Libra. Um, Libra's more about engaging. It's, been an, it's communication in an environment that has fewer or no objections or restrictions. It's about an exchange of ideas and concepts. It's a collaborative effort. These are the, the ideas behind Libra that you get in many other forms of society. So that's where we were with our thinking. That's pretty much the, where we started the company. So what's the benefits to business then for using open source? Um, how can a business benefit from this collaborative effort? We're supposed to be in competition with each other. Most consultancies are in competition with each other for the clients. So what, what's the benefit to each other? What's the benefit to businesses using free software? How can a business benefit from being involved in the community? Well, we'll start off with that. Free code. There's no purchase for the code itself. There's no purchase for anything, but you might pay something for installation disks. You might pay for an expert to come and put the code on your actual server or onto your, onto your computer, but you don't pay for the actual code itself. And nobody really wants to pay anymore for the infrastructure software that a business depends on. You don't really want to pay for your database. You don't want to pay for a programming language. You don't want to pay for a web server that allows you to access the internet. Specifically now that nearly all businesses have to be on the internet. A lot more trade is on the internet. A lot of, a lot of their existence is based between internet communication. You don't want to pay for that basic right to talk to another business. It's madness. You also don't want to pay for the operating system that makes your computers run. That would be like buying an operating system for a car. Not quite a lot of cars do come with an operating system, but it's built into the cost, I think. You don't really want to pay for simple graphic tools. Nobody does. Who wants to pay £1,500 for a copy of, of Photoshop and Illustrator put them together? Especially when the majority of people will actually use it to cut out a picture of their kid and put it in an email. <coughs> or take the background off something. And if you show them how the magic wand or the history brush tool works, they, they will fall over in amazement. And you don't really want to pay for office software. Not when the majority of office software doesn't use any complex tools. You don't use complex macros and spreadsheets. Accountants use complex tools and spreadsheets, and they tend to buy accounts as software. You don't want to pay for the, the massive amounts of Microsoft Word bundled in, or even pages bundled in, specifically not when Lion upgrades and changes it. You don't want to pay a license charge. You, don't, you want no software reoccurring fee to exist. No intellectual property overhead bundled in. You want something that's virtually paid for free. In, in an essence, you've got to reduce technical debt, and that's a technical cost, rather than a technical debt of, I don't know, using Microsoft XP. So, vendor locking doesn't exist in free software. Free language, free tools, free system for delivery, free usage. Many sites devoted to this, such so folks, GitHub, CPAN, um, for delivering the methods of the delivery methods of these tools, and I'll talk a bit more about CPAN. Um, Linux is free, free BSD, BSD units is free, means virtually zero, zero vendor lock into your system. You can move between operating system types. You can move your majority of your tools between those operating system types and they'll work and compile on different systems. Um, 
speaking of that, uh, there's a piece of software I love that's called Inkscape that I want to use as a target. Does anybody know what Inkscape is? Yeah, um, yeah back when I was uh, started doing uh, graphic work, I actually used a program called Trialdra and then went on to Illustrator. Um, and I got introduced to Inkscape by Matt giving me the idea of, no, no, we must use free stuff if we can. It would be better. So I, I got into Inkscape, and thankfully at the time I wasn't using anything complex in uh, vector graphics. So Inkscape did everything. And one of the great things I can do with Inkscape is I can actually port it between my different systems. Um, I'm not locked in to a particular operating system using Inkscape. It will run on many different systems. So, we can play with restricted here. Operating systems that are restricted like Windows and Mac don't specifically allow anything but their own programs to run really well with, but Inkscape will. So what I have on this particular laptop, three different operating systems running at any one time. I usually run Windows because there's a couple of programs I, I don't use them anymore, but I still have a copy of Windows for games. Because, you know, some games just do not run on a Mac at all. I can't get Guild Wars to run on a Mac, so I have Windows running on here, inside a virtual machine, just so I can play Guild Wars. But I can also open Inkscape in it. And at the same time, I can open Inkscape inside the Mac operating system under X11. And at the same time as that, I can open up another VM and have Inkscape open on Debian. And I've actually done this, and you can do this if you try to Inkscape. You can open it up, open three different copies of Inkscape up on three different operating systems on the same machine, and open up the same file. Now, the Mac system will crash unless you close and reopen the file if you make changes in the Linux system. But the Windows one won't, it will actually let you refresh from disk. It will just say there is a new version on disk. Same with the Linux system, a new version on disk. Same file, three operating systems. We have an open file. It works on all of them, and it will work on any of So you can play with your restricted systems. And you can bring your tools to your restricted, restricted systems using Wine. And using other things such as um, an inner Linux and Mac it only environment, a lot of what free software, as you know, is available in there. So even if you particularly like the build quality of a Mac, which I do, you can still use free software on there. And you get some companies such as NVIDIA and HP do produce some codecs that are, that are allowed to be used on Linux systems. So there's not always a choice of you can't have any hardware that works. And of course, we have a lot of community <coughs> people who will build codecs for you to use. So you're not really restricted that much on your choice of hardware to buy. An iPhone works perfectly well on the Linux. You have many tools that allow you to use an iPhone on the Linux. You don't have to get locked into using iTunes. The advantage of using the more free things is there's transparency. So we have transparency of data now. We have an open format for using open data. The storage and transmission of your data is open. That's not open to anybody who wants to look at it, it's open to you. It's not locked in by the company who made the software you're using. They haven't made it some specific file that you can't unlock. You can manipulate and control that data yourself. The data is transparent to you, it's transparent to anybody who works for you that you want it to be uh, transparent to. You don't need excessively clever tools. There's no need to jailbreak any device. There's no need to crack a code if that's open. And all of this is true of FLOSS and FOSS software. A couple of cons, though. I like to think of these people called leeches. Now, in an open source environment, a leech to me is somebody who engages with an open source environment for the free tools and free software. Um, they even use it fully for their business model, but then that's where it ends. They're using it because it gets them an advantage, a competitive advantage when they start the business. And this is specifically true that business grows and they suddenly stop using the open software, or they lock down their version of that open software and make it so that it's closed down and a closed system. This may be because they have lawyers who suddenly said, say things to them like, such as patents, copyright, intellectual property, don't want to get screwed by another big business. And so they lock their systems down. They're actually leeching from a community in a big way. Um, they may have a specific business used to do that, but I think it kills a lot of the advantages you see in dealing with a community. Uh, specifically when you want to deal with the community for in terms of how much the community wants to deal with you in terms of recruitment and in terms of your software which I'm going to get away onto in a moment. The other thing is, as I said previously, you're giving it away. You give away your free software. If, like us, you create software, 
you then have other consultancies who will go after your clients with your software. You, you gave them a competitive advantage against you. Um, you have to rely on people knowing that your service, your expertise, your ability to be a part of a community is far better than this other person who has none of that, just took the free software and goes and puts it on. Of which there's many people who just consultants who never give anything back to a system. They're very, very good at using the free software, but they won't engage with the community. There's also the notion of support contracts, which can be problematical for people when they deal with free software, in that they don't feel that it can be supported properly. Shadowcat Systems actually supports pretty much anything that's on CPAN. But quite a lot of other people won't support anything that they create, and companies won't support after a ter the termination of a contract, or offer any support. They build and move on. So there's this fear a lot of companies have, and it's a, a valid one, that if they employ somebody very good at open source software, that person will move on. And they'll be left then without anybody to help them. And I'm going to tell you how that can be avoided in a few minutes. But it is a con that's seen. Added to that, a lot of very big companies will offer closed software support contracts. They'll also offer closed software support training. And this training is often seen by companies as better than anything else. Even though that certificate they may have doesn't guarantee that when they come in and bollocks up your system, that this big company will fix it. In fact, what they will do is sell you their support and send in their technicians. So certification is about as worthwhile as the paper is written on in most cases. So, if you're involved with the community, and why would you want to be? We made a conscious choice at Shadowcat to involve ourselves directly with communities. Um, both Matt and I are very, very active in the Pearl community. We're also active in the local community as much as possible. Um, and this is just because, you know, we like communities. I mean, I think we do. Maybe not all the people in those communities. Well, I do, but you don't. <laughs> you name them. <laughs> it's not like, you know, he, hide, he doesn't hide it. If he doesn't like you, you'll find out. Um, but it makes really good business sense to be involved in the community. I'm going to tell you now why you get to know people. That single fact is worthwhile all on its own. You can get involved directly <coughs> with a person who may be the software that your business is now working on and using for its business model. You can know their name, you can know what they do, you can know where they are in the community, you can engage with them on various forums, and it's my compelling first reason, and I could actually stop at that reason alone. But you get access to these people, you get access to the authors, and you get access to the language. You get access to the projects that they're involved with. And if you access it right, by engaging with them, by contributing, they'll engage right back at you. So the community will talk to a business, and they don't have any problem talking to a business, they don't really differentiate once you're part of the community. There is no differentiation. You become a link in the community chain. You get advanced knowledge of new features, you get advanced knowledge of bug fixes, latest developments. You get advanced knowledge of everything that's essentially keep your business ahead of everybody else. And if you're supplying to clients, it keeps you very much involved with the, with the tools that they may need for the next generation of their business model. You can advance for them, and that's a good thing to actually promote yourself to them. Your involvement and use of language and in projects can lead to direct influence of new features. And many times we've added features to projects, to mod modules of projects and to libraries, that clients needed specifically for them, but then they've released it out. Now that's now out in the real, in the real world, so to speak, in the real community world. And uh, if somebody else uses it, they're now supporting it, and they may add something to it that comes back to you. You just got development outside of your company and outside of your budget for free. It costs you nothing. You get a slew of people testing and improving code that's required in your own business. And there's also the knowledge that this is actually a great return. You've actually made a difference in the community. That community you're part of, that community that you rely on for your business and for your software, um, you're supporting an ecosystem and you're supporting the members of that ecosystem and that's actually a great return. We're back to influence again. I'm going to build on that. If, if you're in an open source company, 
moving to an open source model. If you're using free software and contributing to free software projects and societies, then your business plan is actually revolving mostly around your software. You've not made yourself that niche that I mentioned. That company, although successful, doesn't get the advantages that you do. You're smaller, more open, more agile, and when you're dealing with a community, you're going to benefit in quite a lot of ways that they will not benefit because their closed system will never be released back out to an environment. An environment where there may be bug reports. People install your software. They test your software. And part of that is that they're going to respond to you if they come up with the problem with your software. The problem that you can now act upon that you may not have found until it became quite a big problem. In the build community, we have a thing called CPAN testers. Now, if you're not familiar with CPAN, it's the Comprehensive Perl Archive Network. It's a massive network of libraries that were uploaded by open source um, <laughs> programmers and contributors. Um, and they share it with the wider world. You can invoke CPAN from a command line and it will install the projects that are on there. It will also install things like and manage your dependencies. That's very simplistic. If you want a better explanation, I should ask uh, Paul, perhaps. You, you can do CPAN, can you, Paul? <laughs> and that CPAN install. Yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> CPAN testers are a group who test modules uploaded to CPAN. Now, what they do is they test every module uploaded to CPAN. And they test it on a wide number of distros. I think almost every distro. They also test it against all the versions of Perl. All the, all the popular versions of Perl, and also some of the less popular versions of Perl and development versions of Perl. So Perl 5.15, which is the current latest development release, um, that's unstable, going towards 5.16, which will be a stable, gets tested by CPAN testers every time they smoke test it. And they produce reports, which they give back to you of your module. They don't charge anything for this, this is all free. So that's 23,000 modules being tested continuously. There are far more modules than that CPAN, but there's 23,000 in a block being tested. They passed over a million tests in a single month last year. They get close to a million every month now. Which means that they've only passed 19 million tests in CPAN testers. I don't think there's anybody else who actually comes even close to that number of tests of their software and systems. That's, that's approaching a massive number of tests. Um, in any, any sense. You can actually go and look at them there. It's worthwhile looking at them because they have a very groovy website uh, with a lot of statistics about Perl, with statistics about the testing culture. They have a blog as well that tells you about what they do in test. Um, there's actually two sides to CPAN testers. This is the one side, which is the, the statistics reporting. Um, and it's almost like there's two natures of it because the other side is the actual uh, uploading and smoke testing. And the two, two, two sides exist next to each other, even though they, all, they, they, they don't just want cohesive over, but this is the reporting side. Some people using your software will get annoyed if it's not doing something they particularly want, and they'll patch it. And they'll send you that patch. So if they notice a bug in it, instead of just submitting an RT ticket or whatever system you're using to have a response back, they'll just send you the patch and say, I tried to use this on an IBM 400 from 54 million years ago that doesn't even have a copy. I'm using B, a variant version of B that doesn't exist. And it didn't work on that, so I compiled it to run on that, because I don't have a life. I'm, I'm thinking of the DBH class. I don't even know what type of IBM system means that you've got it running on, but... Somebody ported it to the version of DB2 for the AS400. There we go. We were soon to be afraid. <laughs> no. In fact, sometimes, if they like your system, they'll build a little community around it. They probably, they probably won't ask you. They will just go ahead and do it. And then they start to add features, and they expand it, and they use usability. And if you don't like this, then you go, no, it's mine, I'm not changing the thing. They'll just fork it and create their own. Because that's what open software allows you to do. It allows you to fork a project and change it and upgrade it and make it into something that you like. So, you get an increased quality of software. Not all projects and modules really receive book packages, but you might get book packages and you might get advanced ones. But if you're in a 
good enough community, you'll at least, at least get a report back to you. And if somebody likes an itch, in it, and it's scratching the itch, you'll get all of these things back for free. There's no downside at all to having any of this. Nobody's forcing you to use an upgraded or changed version. If you like your old version that's buggy but not buggy on your system, you can continue to use the version that's buggy and buggy on your system. This, this is the true medium, meaning of the word freedoms and collaborative. You get to choose what's there and what isn't. So, stuff. Being involved in a community as a contributor and a supporter pays dividends when you need to do many things. Recruiting staff is one of them. But before we get to that, you might actually just want to recruit somebody to fix some small thing, to patch it, evolve it. Knowing the community and being involved in the community means you don't always have to employ a staff member to do this. You may know somebody who specifically can fix that one thing and is an expert on it. And they may in fact allow you to employ them for a very short period of time or consult for you for that one thing. Or if you're really, really lucky, you might say, well actually I was thinking of doing that anyway. If you just go buy a load of beer, well I'll do it. Not thinking of anybody who's ever done that at all. But many of our clients find us to do small amounts of consultancy because they want to actually change one small thing and they know that we're involved with those projects and communities and therefore, since we're contracting, they will find us and use us because they know we're involved. Your involvement in your community is also a resume that makes people want to work for you. Developers are not always interested in money. In fact, some developers are not at all interested in money. They're interested in the interesting piece of code they're working on. Quite a lot of very good developers can earn money pretty much anywhere, and they can bounce from job to job. They sometimes have to want to work for you. Being known in a community is often a good way to get people wanting to work with you. And also knowing the person who comes to an interview, you actually do want to employ somebody. If you're involved in the community, you may know them from that community. You already know if they're an asshole. Or you might also know if they're working on some particular project that you like. Or perhaps they're the author of one of the modules that your, that your model now uses, that your business now uses, as part of its essential in-house software. You could know who they are before they come to you, long before. Many of the people who worked for Shadowcat in the past, but all the ones who work in Shadowcat right now, are all involved in the community, they're all involved in projects, they're all involved in their local groups. Um, about two thirds of them are also conference organisers for the local events, which that's a bit bizarre, but it, it, it's, it's a bit sort of strange when you look at one room and go, hang on, 90% of our staff have organised a conference this year. That's a bit odd. That's going to break, that's going to break somebody's curve somewhere <laughs> in statistics. So you can know the developers for their open source work. So what's the quantifiable return? I'm afraid there isn't one. You can't quantify it in the way that you can't quantify it in marketing. Uh, it's measured. It allows you to be known in an environment. It allows you to keep place in that environment. It allows people to point at you and say, this person promotes this and does this. They're involved in the community in this way. All it does is make you more aware of it. That can't really be easily quantified in terms of how much money do I put in, what's the return on that money I get out. There's no direct return to any investment you're making, either time or money. You can't measure it in any direct sense. All you can measure it is when you see the benefits of being involved. And that you only do when you are involved in that community. But the greatest benefit, which I can tell you, is to know people. And as part of that, they know you. And no matter what level of advertising you've done, no matter what levels of money you offer to staff, not much can outweigh the value of somebody actually saying, this is a great company, they involve themselves in the community, I really like them. Positive upfeed of somebody liking you outweighs any level of money you can do giving them a squishy toy at a conference. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mark's done interesting job of covering it from the side of the business. But what I want to talk a bit about is um, as 
a developer is somebody who enjoys working on and with free software. Um, some of the things about what you can get out of um, being a part of the culture in and of itself, and some of the things of what, what tends to happen and how it works out if you move into that actually being a significant part of uh, where your workload comes from. Uh, so, the first thing I'd like to talk about is the culture side. Now, I, I, I was torn. I, I did seriously consider calling this half community. But, culture is more than that. You are already a part of that culture simply by using and, in, and thinking about this stuff. You are already um, a consumer of that culture, if not necessarily a visible member. And um, that's an important thing to remember, because that happens whether you like it or not, without ever actually going and talking to anyone. Um, and the first thing that you need to do in order to take advantage of being a subscriber to a culture is read words. As in, go find stuff online, read around it, and don't just read introductions and tutorials, look for histories, look for anecdotes. Uh, one of the things that I did when I first got into using the um, Unix environment um, in general, we started off on various bits of BSD and then some Linux and then some Solaris and then back. The thing is, if you read up in the right places, things like the jargon file, but also things like 30 year old Unix user manuals. If you can get a sense of the history and language of the culture, you can get a much better understanding of the technology that comes out of it and why that technology exists. The technology has a mode of thinking around it. This is why people often say learn less, because it gives you an extra mode of thinking. But you also have to remember that where people will take things is significantly based on what their culture is um, and how they look at things. So, to a great extent, the great achievement of Unix is the lots of small parts fitting together um, and the, the, the simplicity. And those are cultural elements that then have technological reflections. And it's worth looking at that and seeing why things became the way they are, rather than merely taking at face value that they are. And, okay. The simplest way of starting with, of actually putting stuff back is writing words. I, I don't just necessarily mean writing a blog. Writing a blog can be useful. Editing a wiki can be useful. Contributing documentation can be useful. And the thing to remember is, when writing words, you always have a unique perspective. And um, it's very important to bear that in mind. It's important to remember that you're always potentially useful. If you had to go and hunt around for ten minutes in order to find the answer to a question, uh, in order to understand something that you were reading, tell somebody. Because it's only going to take them out in one hyperlink to save every other person at the same level of experience as you back 10 minutes in future. And that, that's a huge contribution. Newbie friendly documentation fundamentally happens from this. So that, I mean, that, that's the first one. You don't even need, need to talk to anyone. You, 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 there's no risk of making a fool of yourself. You're just saying, this could do with a high point to that. And by and large, people will go, oh, haven't thought of that. Shit. Uh, the next thing is reading code. People seem to forget open source doesn't just mean that the source is open if you want to modify it. It means the source is open even before you use it, before you ever download it to your machine. And one of the greatest learning experiences I've ever had was going through uh, every single build module that was packaged for NetBSD which is why I was running at the time. Having a quick skim of the docs, and if the module looked interesting, whether I thought I'd ever use it or not, I'd read the kernel and find out how it was built. And that's a huge resource 
for improving your skills, for picking up ideas. You see a piece of syntax you don't recognize. Now you know that piece of syntax exists, and you can go find out what it does. You see an idiom that is unusual to you. You can look at how the idiom sits in the context of it, and if you, if you read a lot, you'll see that idiom two or three times, and you'll start to realize how that fits into the language of the culture, and why you might want to use it, and where... Also, the really nice thing is you can also, from situations that were similar-ish, but where people didn't use that idiom, you can look at where people don't. And this is something that you, you can't... The only other way, really, to find this sort of thing out is trial and error. And error, and error, and error, and error. And it's nice to get a bit of a head start. And, all right, the, the obvious thing is you should also be writing code. But not just uh, writing code because you specifically want to release it. You can write code to test a hypothesis. You can write code to come up with an idea. This isn't, the final product of this is not software. The final product of this isn't running code. But it might be a blog post that contains code for people to read so they can learn the same things you did. Or it might just be you knowing something you can use on another project. Uh, so, assuming you're, you're starting to do this sort of thing, the next step is to actually engage. Um, is to find the people who form the community around your culture and start, one way or another, interacting with them. And the first way of doing that is to ask questions. If you do it right and politely, and you do it in such a way that it's clear that if they go, ah, you need to read this piece of documentation, um, you're happy with that as an answer, people generally don't mind being asked questions at all. The only, the only extent to which I don't answer questions, generally, is when they come by private email, and then I say, please can you ask this question on the mailing list, and then answer them as soon as the post comes through, because now it's in a searchable archive, which strikes me as more useful. Now, asking and answering is, is the obvious way to learn stuff. But it's not the only way. If you're looking at a mailing list or an IRC channel, one of the key things about these things is they're not, they're not solely question and answer. They can be discursive, and not every answer is to a question you've asked. So, being able to actually stay around and look at what other people are discussing allows you to learn. It allows you to learn what people are doing. It allows you to learn what people are using, what problems they're running into. And it, it allows you, once you see the same answer turn up two or three times, you can, you can note that answer down in your head as, this is something that is a best practice in a number of situations. If I ever find myself in one of them, I should probably do this. Um, to a great extent, it's not so much the frequently asked questions that are interesting for learning from, it's which are the frequently delivered answers. And once you start getting into that, the next step is to teach. Uh, that doesn't just mean answering questions saying, there's your bug. It means when somebody has a failure of conceptual understanding, try and explain it to them. Because that is a fantastic way of getting clear in your head what you're doing and how you understand it. Um, I believe it's, it's medical training where in order to be considered somebody truly competent on any given procedure, it should be watch one, do one, teach one. And the, the, the teach one is a very important way of firming knowledge out. Plus, Teaching answers to the basic common questions will free up the more expert people to answer complicated questions. And also, you spread that out, people don't get sick of repeating themselves. You know, um, everybody in Freenode hash Perl knows how to say, no, don't parse HTML with regular expressions. Um, and so, whoever is around and spots that question will say that. 
And that means that those of us who do a lot of answering get so much less frustrated. And trust me, the people, the people who are going to help you when you are the most stuck will notice that you were doing that sort of thing. The other crucial thing is drudge work. What appears to be, what appears to be drudge work can turn out to be really interesting and really productive. There was a point at which I just fixed some sort of bug in a CPAN module. Went to the author and went, this is seriously messing up people downstream with you. Can you do a release? He said, I've not got very much time and there's a lot of tickets in the queue. I use this module all the time. Stuff it. Right. Here's the queue. You're, you're going to be around for a bit, aren't you? It's like, well, yeah, sort of. I'm, I'm, I'm working as well. Like, That's fine. And I went through the entire bug queue and went, that one's rubbish, that one's rubbish, you already patched that one and forgot to close it. That one, uh, I can't reproduce it. Send them a reply saying, no repro, please help. And went through, and after an hour of this, he, he was, he, he'd been, clearly been putting this off for ages. For me, because it was a piece of software that I didn't, look, didn't really work in that heavily, it wasn't really that boring. And after an hour of going through these, and as getting rid of or marking, waiting for a response, about three quarters of the open tickets, he went, you got, thank you very much. Oh, I know what you wanted as a thank you, don't I? And cuts a release. Bam, problem solved. And over, honestly, given, given the number of downstream issues this was causing, over the course of the next two months, that must have saved me a lot more than an hour. Uh, the other thing that, that, that's, that's essential from doing this is to actually meet people. If there's a sort of less technical chat channel, it's worth being in there because it's worth getting into random conversations, especially since you might actually, you know, if, if, if you're saying a chat channel full of people who in the technical channels are great experts, they might end up in a conversation about something that happens to be your hobby and you can provide some, something useful back. And suddenly, again, these people know you're there, they know you're cool, they know you've got a brain. Um, even if your current level of um, ability with their software is sort of the, the same ability as somebody with an IQ of 17 on a rainy day. Um, and this is, this is also how you will end up keeping track of what's going on. Because by listening to what people are uh, just chatting idly about, you can get a picture of the people and thereby understand, again, the mindset from which the code came from, which often makes it a lot easier to see what the code should be like. So, a brief diversion. Most important rule. People don't mind. If you make a fool of yourself politely and with plenty of supporting information so they can immediately tell you why you're a fool, nobody cares. It's not a problem. There, there, there will, there's, there's a significant chance that when you ask a question, two minutes later, just by having asked the question, your brain will go down a path that gives you the answer. The, the, the generally known as the teddy bear effect. Um, a guy called um, Aaron Trevena, who hangs out on IRC quite a bit, has coined what he calls TJ's law, TJ being his neck, which is the odds of you instantly realising a solution after asking for help are directly proportional to how many people and how respected a set of people you've just made a fool of yourself in front of. And it does work. If, if, you're, if you're stuck with a really hard problem, explaining it what appears to be explaining it to the smartest people that you know is a really good way to immediately realise that it's not actually a hard problem at all and you've been being dumb for four hours. Don't worry about that. We all do it, and more importantly, your problem solved. Just make sure to actually explain the solution so that anybody who's listening who might see the same problem in future still gets the advantage, and then, you, then you've still, your, your question and answer are still contributed, even though you answered yourself. Uh, however, the 
the second most important rule is try not to make an idiot of yourself. And this comes from a different direction. This is, you have to realise that this group of people, when you first, when you first join a mailing list or an IRC channel, this group of people have never met you before. They've never heard of you before. They have no idea who you are. That means you have to remember that you will not get the same sort of reactions to saying things as you would with a group of people who you've actually known for a while. And it's very easy to, well, make worse than an idiot of yourself doing that. Um, there's probably little bits of rules that you don't care about that really matter to that. Like, free don't hash pearl. For variegated reasons, we despise pastebin.com. So, it drives us insane when people use that to provide links, especially since we've got a channel integrated paste URL in the topic. And it's, it's reasonably expected if people know IRC that they'll read the channel topic on the way in. Honestly, it shouldn't be as big of a deal as it is, but it, it's, it's become so much of a sort of a pet peeve that it really drives us insane. And for new, for new people turning up, sometimes they'll respond by arguing that we shouldn't care that much. Well, maybe. But I'm really sorry, we do care that much. So please just, just use any other site on the internet. It's not that much. You, you will get things like this. And f from the other side, you have to just say, if they, if they have something like that that isn't really that relevant, just, just go with it. Um, go with it. You can argue about it later when they know that you're not just somebody who likes arguing for the sake of it, when they know that you might have a point. Um, and th the, other, the other version of this is... If you ask a question and somebody says, okay, please can you tell me this? And you think, but that isn't relevant to the question I'm asking. I don't care. Answer the question. Because you have to remember, you're not just talking to these people for their knowledge of how to fix things. You're talking to these people for their knowledge of how to go about working out what to fix. It may not be relevant. Or it may be there's something that you don't know yet that means it is relevant and that will actually give them the answer to your problem. It doesn't really matter either way. The quickest way to move on constructively is to provide the information. And the, 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 the quickest way is always, when, when you're coming into this group, these people are around each other every day. Work with how they interact, learn about their specific subculture within the community. And then later, you can put your, you can put your own stamp on how you're doing things. But don't try and do it up front, because... I, I believe me, I have made a colossal fool of myself on a number of occasions. Um, generally by being sarcastic and forgetting to put sarcasm tags around it for the... Um, East Coast Americans who don't really get it. Anyway, um, so, having said all that, I want to talk a bit about consultancy. Um, okay, what I do for, for a, a living is be hired in as a consultant or and manage a team that get hired in as a consultant. But the, the general principles I'm going to talk about work if you're the main expert on a piece of free software within your organisation. They work um, on the principle of... Um, it, the, the, the consulting as attitude is a conceptual thing. It's about not just doing things, but helping people to do things. Um, so I, I hope that my remarks will be reasonably general, even if you're not looking at going down this path. Um, first thing to remember, you don't know anything about the problems of the person who's coming to you, not in terms of what they want to do. They are thinking about what they need to achieve from a business perspective or a personal perspective. Their business model or their personal desires, you don't know anything about that. And 
You need to understand enough of that to give them good technical advice. But don't try and work out how to actually do it. Um, it's very easy to either assume that the way you would want things to work is what somebody wants. It's also very easy to think that you have to understand everything about what they're doing. And there's a, there's a middle ground somewhere, somewhere in between. But you know, I'll always bear in mind that um, as a naive, as a, they might be a naive user from a technical point of view, but you're a naive geek from the point of view of what's in their heads. Um, especially since, well, <clears throat> frankly, uh, those of us who spend a lot of our time swearing at computers do tend to think about things on average differently to other people. The other thing to remember, though, is you are like unto a god. You know this technical stuff better than they do, probably better than they want to, um, and quite likely better than they ever will. And that's okay, but it means sometimes you need to just make a pronouncement from on high. They're not going to understand the explanation. They ask you because they respect your opinion. Give them an answer. If they want an explanation, fine, try and explain it. But sometimes you, you, you are just in a situation where they ain't going to get the answer, but you know what's right. And if they say, huh, you go, you ask for my advice. If you trust me, go like this. If you don't, I'm sorry, I've tried to explain it. Um, and there's a, there's a point here about niche issues which is, we are all the greatest specialists in the world at our specific skill set. Um, don't ever think that you don't have, a, have something to contribute in a situation because, you know, um, in a mixed systems environment, if there's one guy who's only done six months of programming in his life, that knows basic Windows administration backwards. Just because he's the, he's the lamest programmer on the team in straight line programming doesn't mean he isn't also the only person who's going to solve your Windows problems. Uh, th that's a silly idea, but if, if, if you're looking at taking the business area of this, because collaboration happens outside of companies, the best way to create um, a strong from software oriented business as a consultant as an individual as, is to establish a niche, some combination of things that people care about that nobody else really does. And that, that comes to a crucial thing. Being for hire in that situation, being available makes you special. You don't necessarily have to be the best in the world at something. You have to be the best, best person who is available at the time required. Um, and that, that's, that, that, that's just huge. I mean, uh, one of the reasons that Shadowcat is a viable business is that while we don't have, we don't employ a majority of the contributors to anything that we're working with, but we're pretty much the only um, full service consultancy and training company that employs contributors of all of these projects. The other serious contracts are either part of a consultancy that's focused on a business area, not just on the technology, or they're happily salary, or they're bouncing around from contract to contract, but don't really want to commit to, on, to long term ongoing relationships. Um, in that sense, I have to say, networking of the traditional business style, don't expect it to pay off right now. Networking pays off later. Uh, we got a lead recently from a guy that I haven't spoken to in two or three years because he moved um, out of being um, a developer into being a DBA. And we, we've just not had... And now he's handed, he's, he's handed some development work our way. And the last time I saw this guy was at, I think, OSCOM 2007, um, where he... Uh, I ended up going drinking with him and the Django team. And we've, we've barely spoken two words to each other since. But if we're in that sort of situation, we'll still think of each other. However, it's not just networking. 
Being known pays off now. Having people know. I can go to most CPAN authors and go, I could really, really do with a release tomorrow. And if they've got time, they'll do it. If they haven't got time, I know I can work through their release process, everything except the last button click that requires their authorization, and just hand them the tar.gz file to upload. And they know me well enough to know that they only need to give it a superficial check for the class of incredibly stupid errors that they know I'm going to make it. And can then assume that the rest of it's fine and not well. Um, um, that, that sort of thing is very powerful. And even if you're not a serious developer, being an evangelist, being a documentation contributor, or just being somebody who repeats the answers to FAQs, will make you the sort of person that, they, that um, people trust to know what you're doing and know what your limits are. And that, that becomes hugely helpful. Um, uh, minor point, anybody doing independent work, every single person I have ever seen under charges to begin with. We did so horribly. We eventually noticed that this was just not going to work sensibly. Talked to, talked to a few people and realised we'd been idiots. Um, and while, yes, there's the, the, the social rules say that it's rude to ask somebody else what they charge, what they make for a living, if somebody's a contractor, asking them what they usually charge is much less so, because that's basically what is your price sheet as the company consisting of you. Often people don't mind answering. If you're not sure if they'll mind and don't want to risk just saying, would you mind? Which, personally, I've never found anybody objected to. Um, if you talk to somebody that you've spoken to who does that and say, I think I might be, this is how much I'm charging, now you reveal personal information rather than asking them to do it, and they'll probably engage you in conversation. They'll, they'll almost tell you, my God, double that. Um, or in, 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 one, in one particularly special case I remember, my god, at least double that and get yourself an accountant because the way you've been doing this so far you aren't going to be able to pay your taxes at the end of the year and eat. Um, and and an, an important thing here is that community engagement functions as training. Uh, there's, I remember a, a fantastic occasion a customer sits out and has just installed a server and went, I've just installed a new production box using the standard deployment guide and it's safe faulting when Apache starts. I'm like, okay, show me the trace. Take one look at the trace and go, you've used the wrong Apache um, multi-process module. Strip off work and put pre-fork on, it'll be fine. Five minutes later his system's up and he's like, I that. The, the, the guy, the guy, at that moment, I was a god to him. The truth is, I knew that because a few months back, I'd spent an hour and a half on IRC, painfully and painstakingly going through all of the different possibilities, because I was helping a guy, and neither he nor I had any idea what that error meant. And that meant that when, when I saw it again, I looked like a genius. Nah. I'm just some guy who hangs out on IRC and helps people, and it turns out that that's great training. And at, at the end of the day, somebody who's asking you for help doesn't care if you've ever used a piece of software. What they care about is can you help them with the piece of software. So I'll often help with problems that I know I'll never see, even, when you, even with pieces of software that I personally can't stand using. Uh, because that means if I run into that situation later, I will already know what I'm doing. Um, you also look at code that you publish as your CV. Uh, and it, 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 can, it kind of goes the other way as well, which is that you can have code as an HR marketing tool. A uh, company that we were consulting for at one point we got to build several new CPAN modules in the house and made sure that they got uploaded with sponsored by name of company. The next time they put out a job advert, they, they said, we're involved in the community, C, and provided a search link that pulled up all of those modules by the sponsored by message. 
Suddenly, they've been having all sorts of trouble with their previous round of recruiting. This time, they were deluged with CVs, and quite a lot of them were from people who were, who were already contributors to stuff. We literally... Um, you know, there's the traditional thing of human resources, throw out any CV without a degree on it. We throw out any CV without a pause ID and existing CPAN uploads on it. Because we, we had enough of those that it didn't matter. Um, so it, it, it very much worked both ways, and that's a great way of selling it to a company. You know, you say you're worried that I'll move on and you can't recruit another person who knows this stuff this well. Make it clear that you care back and the people who know it well will come to you. Uh, all of this comes down to not just doing useful things, but doing useful things visibly. Doing it so that the world can see that you've done it. It needs to come up on Google, or it needs to come up on a GitHub search, or it needs to come up on a CPAN search, or it needs to come up somewhere that people can find out about it. Because it's not just about you telling them, it's about you telling them and them looking and suddenly realising that it was already there. That you've not just prepared this stuff to impress them, this is just what you do. And that's, and that's also a very effective way of uh, marketing events. Uh, marketing yourself, marketing a product, marketing a project. Um, if you're working on a, on a piece of software, hang out on the mailing list not of competing projects but of related projects. Um, then help people find solutions that use both. And suddenly you're getting visibility, but through positive contribution. And um, generally nobody has any complaint. The one thing to remember though is, you don't get to escape having management by doing any of this stuff. You can, you, can, you can pick your management, or you can end up being the person who manages. But you're still going to have to do one of the two. It's just you have a lot more control about who is the person with the managerial authority over you. Um, the other crucial thing is, what is the best solution for you, they aren't necessarily going to be able to modify later. So what you have to do when you're helping people with things is teach them how to understand what the structure of this help is. So at the very least they know where to look if they're stuck when they try and uh, make a tweak to it later. Otherwise what is going to happen, and what I've seen happen, is I built um, a chunk of software for a company. It deployed into production, worked brilliantly. Three months later they needed to make a minor change. And the developer assigned to do it got so lost trying to understand um, where he needed to make the change that he re-implemented the entire subsystem. Now that was a little bit of a shame. We were still under contract and he could just have asked. But these things happen and these things will happen. And in hindsight what I should have done is either written... Um, a bunch of extra comments and extra documentation on how to do it, or taking the development team through it in a sort of a miniature meeting, or just been less clever with the code. Um, and you, you have to remember there's a balance because these people may not care as much about that technique as you, and therefore it may simply not be worth them learning how to do it significantly better. The most important thing though, is that all of this talking to people, working with people, engaging with people. If, if you have the right mindset, it's fun. Don't do this, all the things that I've suggested, just because you want to make money out of it at the end of the road. If that's all you want to do, get a job as a finance contractor down in London and never talk to any other people again. That's, that's a path to lots and lots of money, is it? Um, I considered doing that, and then I realised that I could wear an uncomfortable suit for six months and then throw myself off a very tall bridge without needing to live in London <laughs> in the interim. Um, do this stuff because because it's enjoyable, because it's entertaining, and if it gets to if it gets to a point where it's not being fun, reappraise how you're doing it, how you're interacting with this. 
Because really, cool no this stuff is, life's too short to be doing stuff only out of a sense of obligation. Also, if you get to the point where you have that, where, you, where you're risking a sense of obligation, see if you can find newbies to write words and do drudge work for you. Okay, um, and, you know, show them, show them the first half of this video and just don't, don't let them realise that you're tracking them. <laughs> and that's, that's pretty much it. I'm not, I'm not certain that this is directly related to uh, the, the sort of stated advocacy goals, but I would say this is, how, this is also how you get into a situation where a community or a group will trust you enough to be able to do advocacy and to be able to help them with that. Um, the, 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 the march of free software isn't just about how cool the ideology is or how obvious the benefits are in description. It's all of these little diverse concrete examples that you can pull forwards and show to people. Um, and the best way to find those is to talk to the, is to accidentally get into a conversation with the people who are writing them. Thank you very much. Thank you.